and create a sustainable plan for humanity's use of our precious marine resources. We have an obligation to make bold commitments and to take action quickly because we are truly running out of time. There is mounting evidence that our oceans are on the brink of collapse. Warming waters, acidification, plastic pollution, methane, the extraction of oil and minerals, overfishing, and the destruction of marine ecosystems like our coral reefs are pushing our oceans to the breaking point. Last year, scientists studying Australia's Great Barrier Reef witnessed unprecedented bleaching and die-off along 700 kilometers of this magnificent natural wonder. We are seeing similar changes in coral reefs all around the world, from Hawaii to the Florida Keys to Madagascar and Indonesia. Given that coral reefs harbor most of the biodiversity in our oceans, this is truly an alarming sequence of events. I saw this devastation with my own eyes while filming my documentary Before the Flood, which chronicled the impacts of climate change around the world. Marine scientist Jeremy Jackson led me underwater in a submersible to observe the reefs off the coast of the Bahamas, and what I saw took my breath away. Not a fish in sight, colorless, ghost-like coral, an absolute graveyard. We are destroying irreplaceable ecosystems, and in the process, reversing half a billion years of evolution. But given a chance, nature can and will rebound. I recently visited Palau, an island nation in the South Pacific whose very future is dependent on the health of the oceans. Palau is already feeling the impacts of climate change as rising waters have destroyed their homes and their coastlines rapidly disappearing. Palau's people rely on the bounty of the sea as tuna is their number one source of income. Fearing the collapse of this fishery, two years ago, the government designated an area of their waters larger than the state of California as a marine reserve. They are already seeing the benefits of this action. A recent study of Palau's waters found that the protected area had twice the amount of fish as the unprotected waters and five times the number of predatory fish, a key indicator of a healthy ecosystem. By choosing to protect nature, Palau is ensuring the future of their fishery and their economy. Many other governments, including the Federated States of Micronesia, the Cook Islands, and Ecuador are now following suit. In fact, over the past year, the number of protected areas in our oceans has doubled. Last year, President Obama created the largest protected area on the planet when he expanded the National Marine Monument in Hawaii a monument that was originally established a decade ago by President George W. Bush. Protecting our oceans benefits everyone. It should not be a partisan issue. This is the moment for the international community to step up and to continue to show leadership and vision and not be deterred by the misguided actions of a few. Only 3% of our oceans are formally protected today. We can all do far better than that. We can start right now. In just three weeks, the governments in this room will have the opportunity to decide the future of the high seas. This is a remarkable opportunity to create a mechanism to govern and ultimately protect two-thirds of the world's oceans. We simply can no longer afford to have 60% of our oceans open 24-7 for limitless fishing, mining, and exploitation. The world's governments should step up now and pave the way for what could be the single biggest game in ocean conservation by setting ambitious, measurable goals and holding ourselves accountable just as the world has done with climate change under the Paris Agreement. Government officials also need to take direct action to protect the oceans under their jurisdiction. Not long ago, some 10,000 fishing vessels were illegally trespassing in Indonesian waters, decimating the fish stocks and profiting while local fishermen suffered the impacts. Fisheries Minister Susi ramped up monitoring efforts, held illegal fishers accountable, and is leading the way to a new era of transparency in fisheries management by making Indonesia's vessel monitoring system data available to the Global Fishing Watch platform, which my foundation was very proud to fund and launch. This week in Peru, one of the world's largest fishing nations will commit to sharing its vessel monitoring data as well. This is exactly the type of bold and innovative leadership we need more of all around the world. If we do not take action quickly, we stand to lose critical marine ecosystems and species forever. For example, time is running out for the vaquita. 
There are only 30 of these porpoises left in the upper Gulf of California, making it the world's most endangered marine mammal. But Mexican President Peña Nieto has taken steps to implement a permanent ban on gillnets in the area, and I congratulate him for that. If the ban is backed up by effective enforcement to halt illegal fishing and support to fishing communities to use existing Bakita safe fishing gear, the Bakita may still have a chance. But every day counts, and the time for radical intervention to save the species is right now. For far too long, we have acted as if the oceans are an endless resource to be exploited. But as marine biologist Sylvia Earle so eloquently said, everyone everywhere is inextricably connected to and utterly dependent upon the existence of the sea. So on this day, World Oceans Day, ask yourself, what actions can I take? What new bold commitments can I make to protect our blue planet before it is absolutely too late? Thank you very much for your time.